Good afternoon. Happy July 24th. For those of you that are watching out of state, it's a state holiday today. This is the day that we celebrate when the pioneers came into the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. And we have a great pioneer with us today. We're going to hear about uh, stage management today. We're joined by two guests for our virtual seminar. We have Richard Gertain, who is our production manager, and we also have the great festival stage manager, Tanya Searle. We're so glad to have you with us today. <laughs> uh, let me do some thank yous, first of all. Uh, this would not happen without the sponsorship of Cedar City Brian Head uh, Tourism Bureau. And so we're open here for business. You come on down and visit us. We don't have the Utah Shakespeare Festival open for business, but there's plenty of canyons to hike and other great things to visit down here. So come down and join us. And now we're going to hear a little bit about stage management, which I think are the unsung heroes in the theater world. They are the gods and goddesses who maintain the artistic integrity of what we do. And we're going to hear about that. So welcome, Tanya. So great to have you here. Thanks, Mike. Um, our plan is we're going to have a little presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about 40 minutes. You're going to share with us what stage management is, correct? Right. And, Forgive me all. I'm a teacher, so I have a, a Google slide presentation. <laughs> fantastic. So we'll start with that. If you have questions uh, that you were thinking about, you can put those on Facebook and then those will be kicked to us. And we'll talk about that at about, at about probably 40 minutes into this. So uh, Tanya, go ahead. Okay, Tell well, us me, a little bit of what is stage management? Well, let me start by sharing my screen here with everybody. So you can all see my lovely Google slides. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to start by telling you, oh, Google doesn't. I disappeared. Uh, do you see it now, Michael? Absolutely. Great. So I just wanted to start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, this cartoon, this is Morty. They're the stage manager on um, q to q Comics, uh, if you ever get a chance to check that out. But I've been a stage manager for about 30 years. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, <laughs> I've been a member of Actors' Equity Association, which is the, the union of professional actors and stage managers in the U.S. for about 25 of those years. Um, I started in college stage managing. I've been doing it pretty much ever since. I've been really lucky to work professionally as a stage manager my whole career. So um, I've worked here at Utah Shakespeare Festival. I've worked at the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, the Orlando Shakespeare Festival. Um, I've also worked at, in opera in Houston and at the Atlanta Ballet and at Arizona Theater Company and Pioneer Theater Company. So I've worked all over the place in that time. Um, the most of it though here and in Alabama. Um, I've been at USF on and off. This is my 15th season since 1994, so 15 seasons in 26 years. Um, I started here as a production assistant. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit. But, um, and I became festival stage manager in 2017. Um, uh, what that means, being festival stage manager means is that I am in charge of the stage management department here at USF. Um, I hire all the stage managers um, and I uh, manage the day-to-day -day running of the department and um, that includes a variety of duties that are too numerous and confusing and jargony to get into here. But um, in my time here at, at USF, I've stage managed about 23 shows. I went back and counted yesterday. So um, that's a good approximation. And these are just a few of the ones that I've been lucky enough to do here at Utah. Wow. So um, I wanted to start by uh, talking, whoops, my uh, computer is delaying here. There we go. So what is a stage manager? So the easiest way I can think of to explain what a stage manager is, is think of the show as a wheel and the stage manager is the hub of that wheel. It is our job to communicate with all the various departments of the theater. You see some of them on here. Um, information about the, sh the details of the show. So um, our jo primary job is to make sure information keeps flowing from the rehearsal room and from the performances to all of the departments in the theater um, throughout the process of, of doing a production. Um, stage managers, I would say stage managers main duties are organization, uh, communication, 
and management, both of people and of stuff. Um, we deal with a lot of both. Um, so that's the way I like to think of it, kind of as, a, as the hub of a wheel. Um, my slides are not cooperating. That's all right. It's getting there. Um, sorry. So uh, the duties of the stage manager. Um, we have a lot, and as I was trying to put this together um, and was going through it, um, I realized that there are probably way too many to mention here. So I'll just sort of cover the basics. Um, we do a lot of paperwork. We create daily schedules. We create cast lists, all kinds of show related paperwork that helps rehearsals and performances run better and, and, and helps with that communication. Um, we run rehearsals and performances. So we do what we call calling the shows and run the backstage. Um, we also, um, Take, keep the prompt book, which has all the lines and the blocking and all of that stuff. And we um, uh, maintain the show. So we give notes to actors and, uh, and the crews and all other kinds of other departments as needed and, um, and many more. And those are sort of the nuts and bolts of the day-to-day um, -day job, the sort of physical stuff that we do. But the, there's, there's more than that. There's sort of non-material responsibilities and stage management too. Um, and these are some of those. Um, we answer questions and we solve problems a lot. That's, I would say, a really important part of our job. Um, in fact, we often think of ourselves as trying to see problems before they become problems so that they don't become problems. Um, um, we, we are probably one of the, uh, along with the director, the, one of the people that sees every aspect of the show. And, um, and so we, can, we get a big picture view um, and that helps us with that job. Um, communication is also really important. Um, there are several ways that we help, that we communicate as stage managers. Um, we have here at Utah, we have weekly production meetings. So everybody re uh, related to a show, everybody that's working on that project, directors, designers, staff, um, stage management, everybody but actors typically, um, meets once a week and we kind of make sure we're all on the same page and, and see if anybody has any questions uh, that they need to get answered and or clarified um, and just make sure that we're all moving forward in the same direction um, every week. It's good to kind of have an opportunity to touch base. We also talk about like if we need to have specific meetings about um, other other things, like if we need to have a detailed meeting that's just about the blood in Othello or just about this trick that this prop is gonna do and so we can explain it to the actors properly. We do a lot of, of those kinds of meetings too. Stage managers also create what we call rehearsal and performance reports. So after every rehearsal and after every performance, we put together a document that we send out to everybody working on the show that's a bunch of notes of all kinds to sort of say, you know, Here's what's going on. Here's what we, the director would like to have added. Here's what we want changed. Here's what came up today. So that everybody who's not actually in the rehearsal room every day, like we are, knows what's going on. Um, I see my job as a stage manager, primarily and most importantly, as creating a space where a community of artists can come together and make great art, that they can feel, uh, open and engaged and collaborative. And that I think is probably the most important part of my job. And I do that by trying to create a, a positive and energized um, atmosphere in the rehearsal hall at, and on stage at all times. And I'm so glad you captured that. This is a beautiful quote from Al Franklin, but what you just said there is that essence that I think is hardest for people to hire and capture. And if you can do that, which is what Tanya Searle and her crew do, that's the greatest, that is, that's the greatest thing. I mean, directors, uh, to, to create that safe space is not a, an easy thing. And, uh, and this is a that. great quote um, from Al Franklin. It's the end of actually a very long uh, quote that he talks about um, when people accuse stage managers of not being artists, uh, yeah. that that in fact they are, you know, it, it's, it's, another, it's another art form. It's not just about writing stuff down and, and doing things that other people tell you to do. Um, it's much, much deeper than that. And, you know, sort of going along with that, 
I don't know how many of you saw Renee Thornton's um, seminar yesterday. He talked about there not being any right way to be an actor. There's also no right way to be a stage manager. There are industry standards and sort of um, those kinds of things to be sure, but there are as many ways to stage manage as there are not just people, but as there are shows. I'm going to be slight, approach things slightly differently, whether I'm doing Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat or Othello. Um, so there's, there's no one right way to do this job, just like pretty much any job in theater. Um, it's... Uh, that's part of what makes it so exciting. Cool. Um, so some of the qualities of a good stage manager are pretty much what you would think. Um, it's good to be diplomatic. Like I said, we'd have to spend a lot of time managing people. We have a lot of plates in the air at one time. So organization and being detail oriented and efficient is important. Um, <laughs> calmness, uh, as you can see, I'm already calm. I'm the stage manager. Um, <laughs> Is, is important because, you know, things go wrong, things happen, people are human, stuff breaks, I've had to stop shows, and um, you, it's just going to lead to more problems if you don't have, if you're not able to kind of breathe and keep your head about you. Um, empathy, we talked about a little already. Um, you know, I'm not the one who is putting myself out on that stage, um, so I need to understand what that feels like. To, trust me, this process right now today is teaching me that really well um but uh and a sense of humor is also really important i try not to take myself too seriously um there are all kinds of stage managers um i work every summer with about with a team of about 15 amazing human beings um some of whom are probably watching and laughing at me because they know how much i hate being on camera um <laughs> But they come, they come to Cedar City from all over the United States. Um, typically here at USF, we have each show gets a team of three stage managers. There is a, a stage manager, an assistant, or a deck stage manager, and a production assistant on each show. There are some exceptions to that, but um, that's typically the way we do it. Um, a production stage manager here, or uh, the title festival stage manager is sort of unique to Utah. Um, in other regional theaters, they're called production stage managers. That's the person that's sort of over the department. Sometimes they call shows and sometimes they don't. I, I also work on shows here. The stage manager is um, the other members of my department that are in charge of shows. The assistant or deck stage manager is the person who is in charge of backstage and the preparation of any information that, um, that helps with that task. Here at, at Utah, the production assistants are often in charge of the script. They keep track of any changes that the director uh, makes in terms of lines, whether they're cuts or ads or changes. Um, and they also give actors line notes so that we help them memorize um, their lines by every time we do a run through, we, we write down everything they say incorrectly and let them know, uh, which makes us really popular. Um, <laughs> we sometimes also have here uh, shows with young people in them. Um, so we often have a youth stage manager who is in charge not only of supervising uh, those younger performers, but also helping them learn their blocking and their lines and they help them write that kind of stuff down because they're not necessarily as experienced at it. Um, and there's stage managers in all kinds of artistic fields, not just theater. Uh, like I said, I've worked in opera and ballet. Um, if you've ever gone to a big conference and there's been a big presentation, um, uh, there's a stage manager uh, running that. Cruise lines have stage managers for their shows, those big Las Vegas shows, whether it's Cirque or, um, you know, Footloose, they all have uh, stage managers. Even the circus has a stage manager. So there's stage managers everywhere. TV, there's stage managers on television also, but that job is a little bit different than what we're talking about here. Um, this is something really cool I wanted to share with everybody. I was doing a little um, research uh, this week on the history of stage management and came across this um, doctoral dissertation written by a woman in England named Tracy Cattell. Um, it's likely that stage management has been around as long as theater has been around, although stage managers weren't called stage managers in the sense that we understand it until the mid 20th century, believe it or not, that recently. Um, there was probably somebody making sure Euripides showed up to the theater on time, um, but there was no position called a stage manager. Um, but in the Elizabethan era, around Shakespeare's time, um, actors, actor managers like Burbage um, began to build more permanent theater structures like the Globe. 
and um, they wanted to compete with other kinds of entertainments. And so to perform a play in one of those permanent theaters required a license from the Master of the Revels. And what that, what that license consisted of was that this position, this person who was called the bookkeeper. This gets me so excited. Took the book, which was the only copy of the entire script, because in those days, as some of you probably know, actors didn't get the entire script, they only got their part. So the bookkeeper took the book to the master of the rebels, who then marked whatever he wanted um, cut from the script that he didn't approve of, and then he would sign it. And what you see here in this picture is the license, the signature of George Buck, who was the master of the rebels in 1611. This is from the Second Maiden's Tragedy, which is a, the script belonged to the King's Men. Believe it or not, there are 14 extant prompt books from the Elizabethan era in the British Library. So, wow. um, so this, is the, this is the license for that play. So and that's the, Shakespeare's company. I mean, the King's Men was Shakespeare's company. company. Correct. Yeah. And, um, so the bookkeeper was the person who was in charge of keeping these scripts, because if you didn't have this script and you didn't have this license, you couldn't perform. So um, they are sort of the very earliest professional stage managers. Um, they also had very a lot of other administrative duties. Um, they would um, be responsible for making up the list of the props that were needed for the show. They also made this thing called the plot and it would post it backstage and because the actors didn't have their whole, uh, the whole script, um, they would uh, list the entrances and what they were supposed to bring with them and, when the, and it would tell the stage keepers who were what we think of as stage hands, um, when to move things on and off the stage or, and when the stage keepers should run the special effects. Um, uh, Cause they did have a lot of special effects in Elizabethan theaters. So, um, we still, to this day, stage managers, especially for big musicals and that kind of thing, create that kind of paperwork and post it backstage so people know what scene is coming up next. So um, this is where stage man modern stage management really got its start. Um, and since then, as productions have become more technically um, sophisticated, all kinds of theater jobs um, became more specialized, including stage management. So I thought this was kind of cool as a... Yeah fact about where stage management started from professionally. Um, so I think what I want to do now is sort of talk through the, the, the process that a stage manager goes through here at Utah and sort of the different phases of a production. Um, those being prep, rehearsal, tech dress, and performance. So uh, we'll start at the beginning with prep week. So stage managers here, um, and equity requires this, um, usually start about a week before the actors get here and rehearsals start. And um, in that time, we do a lot of stuff. We have a lot of meetings. We create a lot of paperwork. We create the prompt book. I've been talking about prompt books. This is basically a prompt book. It's a binder, a three-ring binder with everything I need for the show, including the script, just like a bookkeeper. Um, divided by tabs. So I create one of those for every play and the ASM has one and the PA has their own. Um, here at Utah, because we work in repertory, we rehearse a lot of, we rehearse and perform a lot of plays at the same time. So it takes quite a while and quite a lot of folks to get ready to start doing all of those shows at once. We just jump right into all of those rehearsals um, starting at the same time. Um, a lot of work has been happening already before stage management gets there. You know, there's been design, design work and conferences and all kinds of uh, stuff being done by our full-time production staff. But as stage managers arrive, um, they pull all of that information together in a way that makes uh, rehearsals possible to begin. So um, one of the things that we do in this time period is we prep the rehearsal room so we get that ready to go. Um, we don't rehearse on the stage with the full set because it's being built and loaded in as we're rehearsing. We're doing all that stuff at the same time. So uh, we have to have some way to show the actors and the director what the set will look like when they get the real thing. And the way we do that is sometimes we get from the scenery director, we get rehearsal stairs or we get a, a door on wheels that we can roll around and use in the rehearsal room. We get tons of furniture and props and hand props from, from the prop department. We get rehearsal costume pieces from the costume shop. So we have all of that physical stuff, but we also 
um, take the ground plan, which is the bird's eye view of the set created by the designer, and we tape it onto the floor. And so that's what, this is what that looks like. So this is a ground plan for one of three shows from the Adams from 2015. This is Henry IV, part one. Scenic designer for this season in the Adams was Vicki Smith. So you can see here, this looks like an architectural drawing, right? So there's the stairs are drawn out and the doors, and then here's the balcony. And then this is a platform that's added on the Adams stage and there's a trap. So all of this information is on here and it's, um, you can't see it cause I cut it off, but this is to scale. So this is a quarter inch of this drawing equals a foot, just like an architectural drawing. So here is the same thing, but for Taming of the Shrew. And here's the same thing for King Lear. Now all three of those shows were rehearsing in the same room so we have to tape them out on top of each other. And the way we do, we indicate the different shows is we use different colored tape. So this is what this looks like when it's in the room. I know it's kind of hard to see because it's at a weird angle, but um, the green is um, Henry, is uh, Henry, I believe. The red is um, Lear and the yellow is Taming of the Shrew. And then you can see back here, just like on the ground plan, the dotted line, is the edge of the balcony. So um, we couldn't, because we can't fit the whole stage in here, we concentrate on the main playing area, which is the downstage part, the, the, you know, the inner, the below. And then the white lines are the outline of the atoms itself. So that's what it looks like to tape out a floor. The stage managers take scale rules and measure all those grand plans. We plot a bunch of points and then we, it takes all 15 of us a full day to do six or eight shows um, to tape out during that prep time. Then we move on to rehearsal. Um, every stage management team member has their own specific duties during rehearsal, um, which are numerous and varied. Um, but a lot of what we do, we, you know, paperwork continues, more trees die. Um, we, uh, we do two primary tasks in rehearsal. We keep track of blocking and we keep, and we track things. So blocking is the movement of the non-human things in a show, uh, the movement of the human things in the show, the actors, and tracking is the movement of the non-human things, furniture, scenery, costumes, props, all of that kind of stuff. It's important to keep track of blocking because often the director or the actors will come to the stage manager who's been writing all of this down every day and say, hey, what did we do last time? I like that better than what we just did. I want to go back to that. Um, or I don't remember which entrance I had, which, you know, which door I came in, can you tell me? So it's our job to keep track of that kind of stuff. Um, and it's also a way later on to make sure that we're maintaining the show, uh, the blocking of the show that the way the director wanted, that um, things are staying the same. Um, and we use it to teach understudies as well. And tracking is important because we need to know not just where things start, but where they end up. So like you might have a chair that is used in a scene and then it gets taken off stage and then it has to come back again when we go back to that same location. So we need to know where that chair ended up so we can move it back to where we need it to come in the next time. Um, so we need to track all of that kind of stuff. And also because we perform in rep, we have to make sure that when we're putting everything away at the end of a show every night that we have everything that we need, all of those small hand props, um, because next time we come to it, we wanna make sure nothing is missing. So it's important to know tracking. So just as an example, this is a blocking page from my script for Henry V, which was um, in the, the, one of the first shows in the Engelstad in 2016. So you can see I have a, 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 piece of, a page with um, a bunch of numbers on it and a little miniature version of the ground plan. And then I write down um, what the action is. I use all kinds of abbreviations and symbols and arrows um, to note what that movement is for that sequence of action. This one doesn't have the actual fight choreography in it, it just has the entrances and exit of the actors. This is what it looks like um, when there's uh, blocking related to, for me, this is how I do it, like I said, everybody does it a little bit differently for when there's related to dialogue. So again, it's the same numbered sheet with a little miniature ground plan. Here you can see I've just written letters on here to signify where the actors are standing on the set in this particular page. And I've drawn a little, this is the dining, a bigger version of the dining room table, so I could do that over here. There's a little number in the text that says where the action happens. And then if you go across at number five, it tells you what the action is. And that's true throughout the page. So that's how I keep track of 
blocking. I'm sure you're going to share this, but on the other side of the page, I just love that, that light cue, sound cue. Yeah. These are the cues, and we'll get to those in a little bit. Okay. Um, but yes, um, so uh, we'll talk about cueing in a, a, at the end, but uh, when we get to talking about calling a performance. But yeah, these are all the, those are all the cues for the show. Um, this is a tracking sheet. <laughs> this, it's probably hard to see, and I picked this one on purpose. Um, this was a costume flow chart. It was created by Emily Wilkie, who was the production assistant on Joseph last year, along with hey, Emily, Star, who was the uh, ASM. So what this does is it tracks um, every entrance and exit of every actor. You see here, here's Alex Allred. Um, here's the first scene of the play. Um, here's the character he's playing. Every single page is here. They've taken timings of every page so they know at what time in the sequence of a run every page happens. <laughs> um, and then they've noted uh, here uh, on page 19, he exits in L1, which is the first wing on stage left. Um, and he changes from Reuben into a prisoner. And that's what the gray block indicates that he's got a costume change and he has seven minutes to do it. So this helps wardrobe department figure out when and where people are coming off stage for costume changes and how long they have and how many people are changing at the same time. This is a really complicated, beautiful piece of paperwork. Um, and uh, <laughs> so this gives you a little, and this is just one, we also track props and scenery and this is just one of many that we create. So um, I wanted to share this with everybody. I thought this was pretty cool. Amazing. Um, and then we get into tech dress, we move on to the stage. Um, we start adding all of the technical elements. Um, we use all of that paperwork we created to make sure that everything, the purpose of a lot of that is to make sure that tech and performances run smoothly. We thought through all of the scene shifts and we know, and so we've written them all on a piece of paper so we know what has to move when and in what order. Um, and then we rehearse it so that we make sure that what we thought was gonna happen is actually gonna happen. Um, Stage manager, the production stage manager, learns to call the show. So I get light, sound, uh, automation cues, all that kind of stuff from designers. And I've had conversations with the director all through rehearsals about when they want things to, to what they want things to look like. And we put that all together and I put it in my book and I figure out the timing of when all those cues have to happen. And this is when we talk about the artistry of it too, I think, Michael. It's like, my job is to call those cues in a way so that it happens the way the director and the designers envision. So it, they don't just tell me where to call it. They give me an idea of what they think, but I have to, it's an art to figure out that timing. Yeah. So and, I and, need it will, to know, and it will change. Uh, it, it, it's not right. just a machine. Uh, you've got to feel that. Right, I have to breathe with the show so that yeah. you know if something is slightly different one night, Things are happening the way they're supposed to happen. Um, you know, cues take, I have to know the intention of a cue as well, not just when it's supposed to happen. Right. So um, if I know the intention, I can then figure out backing up from there, because a cue is, doesn't happen instantaneously. I say go, that's how I tell somebody to take a cue. And it takes a second for the, for the board op to hear the go, to push the button, and then for us to see the cue happen. So I have to figure out backing up from that. So it's a, it's a little dance between me and the, and the stage crew and the board ops and- um, But then when we add the audience, which is yeah. another character that behaves differently every night. Exactly. So that's the humanity, or I love that you say that you breathe with the show to make right. it happen. So, and the, state, the assistant stage manager, the deck manager is busy running backstage during tech, learning their track. Um, they make sure everything's set up correctly, scenery, props, costumes, all of that stuff. Um, and check all of that stuff that other departments are setting up before uh, rehearsals and performances. They're the direct supervisor of the stage crew um, during tech rehearsals and performances. And they also, like if an actor needs a Band-Aid or if they can't find their prop or they're not sure what's happening next, they're there as a resource for the actors as well. And they're my link to backstage. You know, I can't see what's going on back there. So we, we're both on headset. We can talk to each other and they can let me know if, you know, the scene shift isn't going to be ready and we're going to have to stop, you know, which has happened. Um, and then sometimes here at USF, production assistants leave after a show opens because the, the, the script is set. But often they, uh, on a bigger show, like a musical, they'll stay and run, um, run a track like an ASM. Um, they'll share sides, you know, one will be on one side of the stage and one will be on the other. 
So that sometimes happens as well. And then we get to performance. And um, once the show is open, the stage manager's job doesn't stop. Um, we, can, we continue to call the show and run the shows backstage. And, and um, in most regional theaters and on Broadway, um, the director doesn't stick around unless it's, you know, Brian Vaughn or, or an artistic director um, directing a particular show. So they leave and it's my job to maintain that show for them. It, um, the designers leave. So it's my job to make sure that the show looks the same, roughly the same, because shows grow and develop um, on closing night as it does on opening night. And that the audience gets the same experience no matter when they come or they could come multiple times and basically have the same experience. So we give notes to the actors as well as the crew, both um, all stage management does. And, um, you know, we'll put a note. We do rehearsal report, performance reports, like I mentioned earlier, and say, you know, Ben, sorry, we broke that chair. Can you please repair it? Um, and uh, we also like to give notes when people are doing a good job. We have a little section in performance reports that is about what the experience of the show was that night. Um, and uh, talk about, you know, the audience reacted really well to this moment, and we got a, we got a lot of applause or a lot of laughs in this moment, um, and so we like to give uh, positive re uh, reinforcement as well as negative. Um, so we also, uh, once the show is open, rehearse understudies and make sure they're ready to go on if and when that has to happen, um, and we keep updating paperwork as things shift uh, or we discover new, uh, new things. So then we get on, I wanna talk a little bit about, we talked about this a minute ago with Michael calling the show and all those cues you saw in that book. So in a minute, I'm gonna play, a, a, a Richard's gonna play for us a video of me calling a fight sequence from our production, that production of Henry V from 2016. Um, so we've already talked about calling a little bit, but I wanna talk a little to you about cue lights. Um, sometimes if there's no dialogue or if it's hard to hear or see what's happening on stage, the actors don't know when to enter, so I have to cue them visually, and I do that using a cue light. So what a cue light is, the picture on the right is a cue light. Um, this, in this case, it's a little Christmas bulb. <laughs> These are in the Engelstad. Um, they're all over backstage. Uh, we have them in the Randall and the Ains too, but they're all over backstage and also in the front of the house too. So next time you come to see a show in the Engelstad, take a look around, see if you can find one. Um, and then on the left is the control board for these cue lights. So you can see they're labeled um, with coded labels, but uh, above right house, above right, inner above right, inner above left. So it's different location, cue lights in different locations are labeled. So what I can do is slide the slider up on the control board, which turns the light on, which tells the person who's looking at it, which we've discovered in tech that they need a cue light, to stand by. The light on means stand by. When I want them to, when I want the cue to happen, I slide the slider down and the light turns off and that means go. So I can turn on and off multiple lights at the same time to cue multiple people in different locations. I can cue actors and scenery at the same time. Um, so uh, that's the, and the reason I mention this is because you're gonna see cue light notation in the script we're gonna see, but you won't see it in the video because the cue light box in the Engelstad is not set up at the moment. So in addition to telling other people when to go with cues, you're actually calling, and calling those cues, you are giving those cues to individuals in different parts of the theater as well. Right, and so sometimes it's a combination of me calling cues and me cueing people visually through the use of cue lights at the same time. So this is the script sequence for the section of Henry V that you're gonna see in the video. This set was designed by Scott Davis. Um, so the post-it notes, the yellow post-it notes, this is what I use, I use for standby. So I stand by every cue to let the operators um, and the people who are uh, being cued know that they need to be ready to take the cue. Um, the LQ stands for light cue, the SQ stands for sound cue, um, QL stands for cue light. So I'm turning on these four cue lights and then you'll see down here uh, later on those cue lights get turned off and on a lot in the sequence because I'm it, there's no dialogue because it's a fight. So I'm cueing people a lot um, with cue lights and because Shakespeare didn't leave any space in the text for the um, fight itself any blank space and there's a lot of cues. I added a blank page in my book. Um, so you can see over here, these are in the blank page. This is what I'm looking for 
in order to know when to call the queue. This is what I'm actually queuing. And then any group of queues that's grouped together like this around a single line, those queues are called together. And you can see here's where those queue lights go off, then they're back on, then they're off, then they're on, then they're off, then they're on. Game of Thrones is the name we gave to a clump of fighters because um, <laughs> uh, we just thought it was funny. Um, and so I had to cue them as, a, as a, verbally, and I did that by telling Jade, who was my ASM on this show, to tell them when to go instead of a cue light. They were all clumped together with swords over their heads. You'll see them in the video. And so they couldn't see the cue light, so she had to yell at them to go. Um, and then this is the last page of that, of that section. So Richard, I'm going to stop sharing, and if you could play the video, we can see what it looks like and hear what it looks like to, for a stage manager to call a show sequence. Field. There's not a piece of feather in our camp. Good argument. I hope we will not fly. <laughs> and time hath worn us into slovenry, but by the mass, our hearts are in the trim. And my poor soldiers tell me yet ere night they'll be in fresher rows, or they will pluck the gay new coats or the French soldiers' heads and turn them out of service. Standby lights 141 through 144, sound 164 through 178, fog and Game of Thrones. Harold, save thou thy labor. Come thou no more for ransom, gentle Harold. They shall have none, I swear. But these, my joints, which if they have as I will leave them them, shall yield them little. So tell the constable. I shall, King Harry. And so Flights 141 well, and sound 164. I shall hear Harold anymore. Go. Trap fog. Lord, once more come again for a ransom. Go. My lord, most humbly on my knee, I beg the leading of the vanguard. I'm listening to music and watching Take actors. It. For both your... Flights 142, sound 166 and air below fog. And how thou pleaseth God, dispose the day. Go. Me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun sequence to call. You know, I'm, I'm watching to make sure the actors aren't getting injured as well as trying to watch um, the uh, the queuing. What I need for the queuing for the fight as well. Right. Um, and then just one last thing. If you if you um, enjoyed that, uh, and um, you're kind of a stage management nerd like I am. The Royal, uh, the Royal National Opera, the Royal Opera House in London did this really cool project a few years ago called Opera Machine. Um, they did, they filmed a production of Valkyrie um, with 17 cameras and you can go onto their website. We'll post this in the Facebook comments um, so that you can check it out if you are interested. And you can follow along on any camera you want to watch any front of house or backstage shot that you that you find interesting. You can all, one of those is the stage manager, so you can listen to and watch the stage manager call the show. And um, they also have a way that you can follow along in their prompt book um, as they do that. It's really pretty cool. 
Um, so, it, and it's, uh, they talk much more slowly than I have today. So uh, if you want to uh, get more information on how that kind of process works, I would suggest checking this out. It's really pretty cool. But um, that was all I had to say. Uh, that is, well, that is fantastic. And, uh, and guess what? This is so, this is so Tanya. Do you see what time it is? It is 141. <laughs> Not only did she put all that together, but she also has re rehearsed that two or three times to make sure that it's, uh, and she told us, she said, I've got about 40 minutes worth of content. So uh, spoken like uh, to Tanya, uh, you'll be, uh, we have many, many questions to get through here. Oh my goodness. Many, many questions. I'm going to start first of all with uh, what show have you called that had the most cues? The most cues. Hmm. I know that's tough. Probably Peter Pan. And is that because um, of lighting or sound? It, it's it was uh it was a musical, um so it had a lot of lighting and sound cues. I called um a lot of spotlight cues in that show. I, uh, sometimes stage managers don't call spotlight cues, or sometimes there's a special stage manager who only calls spotlight cues. But in that show, I was calling them all, and there were flying cues as well. So um, there was a lot, and it happened a lot of it happens very quickly and there's a lot of scene changes and it was just a very it's a very complicated show well and I, I uh, again i just want everybody to know in addition to maintaining the order of what's happening there you're also having to assess for the performance reports that everyone's going to so you got to watch that scene in addition to calling all of that too right right so you're watching for um for content and for safety and for all of those things as well as for cues yeah uh, uh, Tracy asks, how long does it take to put together a tracking sheet? It depends. On, I mean, really, it takes the entire rehearsal process. So it's something that we start, we prep it, we, we do whatever information we can. Say we're working on a shift plot, which is a form of a tracking sheet. We'll start with the designs that we know about when we get there during prep week and put in the information we know about. And then over the course of rehearsals, as we learn more and things change, it evolves. And even through the course of tech, you know, a lot of the times every every night after tech, the uh, the deck stage manager will collect all of the crew's uh, run sheets, shift plots, with their handwritten notes about the things that changed, and then make and then update it, and then hand out new ones the next time we, we get to tech for that show. Mm -hmm. And um, and things will even sometimes change. We'll discover, oh, it's easier in performance. It's easy after we've done the show for two weeks. It's easier if I do it this way. And so the paperwork changes. So well, and we, we haven't talked about this. Uh, I know the answer, but I want uh, everyone out there to hear this answer. So the show ends. You're out at 1030 or 11 o'clock. You gather all of those things. And then you go into your cubicle and you go there. And what time do you get home that night? Your day's not over. It, it depends. I mean, you know, uh, it depends on the show. Some shows have more notes than others. Some stage managers take more notes than others. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm usually pretty quick. We have a system here where typically our, our assistant stage manager or deck, uh, our deck uh, supervisor run, uh, is putting in notes as the performance is going on if they have time. And so, um, and I'm taking notes as we go through the show. So it's mostly a question after the show of, of editing and proofreading. Um, but sometimes you don't have time, like on a show like Peter Pan, you don't have time to do that during a performance. So it's, you know, it's an hour or so afterwards. Right. Um, to get that report out. It's always fun walking through the offices at 1 and 2 a.m. in the morning here because they're all still working. They're all still here. Um, Tracy asks, just like actors do their homework and practice rehearsing their lines, do you have to practice your cues in order to feel ready for a show? Do you go that calling sequence? Uh, if it's especially complicated, I do. Um, and I certainly did to call, I hadn't called Henry V in four years, so to make that little video I practiced. Um, but uh, yes, although tech is the time for us to learn that stuff and for us to practice that stuff. You know, if you don't, if, if you're relying on a sequence, if you're calling a sequence where one thing has to complete before you can start the next thing, you can practice it in the abstract, but it's much harder. Yeah. Where, where practice comes in is if I am taking over calling a show for another stage manager, I can watch an archival video of that show and sit there with their book and practice right. calling that show. So, um, so that, that we do that, that way for sure. I think this question from Michelle uh, ties into that and you can explain that. Uh, 
for the most part, a stage manager stays on the same show all the way through, but sometimes you have to have another stage manager come in and take the place of a stage manager. So she asks, I hope I'm getting this right, Michelle, you cannot be at two afternoon shows and two evening shows, so how are your notes called or announced by others? And I think what she's asking is, that means you have stage managers in each of those shows. Correct, those correct. Shows. So there's, the, there's always a stage manager for, this, for the shows that are happening. So I may have a show in the afternoon and then a different show in the evening. Absolutely that happens. Right. But obviously it has, if we have that two matinees going on at the same time, that's two different teams. Two separate teams, yeah. Two separate teams. And we, sket, and, we, and we assign the teams based on the calendar. So, you know, if you're doing this show, you can't do that show. Right. Um, uh, Talk a little bit, because I think this ties in. It's, it's important to know that you are a member of Equity. And yes. Equity does not allow any actors who are members of ac Equity to perform unless there is an Equity stage manager there because of the of what is required. Um, right, so we're responsible for making sure that all of the equity rules about rehearsal conditions and times and breaks and all of that kind of stuff are being followed. Um, I have for been fortunate in my career to never ever work any place where that's ever been a problem, where I've had to fight about that with anybody, certainly not here. Um, so, but, but that is part of our responsibility and that is part of what equity requires. So um, I may cover, you know, we do a, a lot of rehearsals, what we call secondary rehearsals here. So, you know, Hamlet and, um, and uh, uh, Book of Will might be in rehearsal, but the person who's playing a smaller part in Hamlet may be in a big scene in another show and they're not called for that rehearsal for Hamlet so they can rehearse their other show but there needs to be a stage manager there. So I'm not doing that show, but I can cover that rehearsal. So right. we, we cover for each other a lot. Cool. That way. We're, we're into some more personal things here too. So I think uh, you're gonna love these. <laughs> First of all, um, why did you choose stage management as a career? What drew you to stage management in college? That comes from Dan, thank you, Dan. But why did you choose stage management? And she shared some cool stuff before. We'll see if she does that or not. Well. Really, stage management chose me. Um, I grew as a kid. I my mom was uh, active in community theater, and um, so I did a lot of theater as a child. I was always on stage, and I and the same through high school. And I went to college thinking I was going to be an actor. And I went to a very very small liberal arts school with a very small theater department, and I could not get cast in a show to save my life. Mm. And I took acting classes and they made me physically sick. I was so scared. <laughs> so I was like, hmm, I'm not really very good at this and I don't really enjoy it all that much. And my acting teacher actually was doing a show that he needed a stage manager for. And he said, hey, do you, can you do this for me? I don't know if he saw something in me or he was just desperate, but uh, I did that and it stuck. I've done that ever since I fell in love with it. It's, the, it's a perfect combination of of art and science for me. So yeah. cool. I love baking too. Uh, uh, I'm gonna go fast and we may go a little long, Richard, huh? All right. Uh, great questions you coming in. 10 minutes. I, uh, no, 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 I'm just telling you, prepare okay. yourself. I know you're about hard endings, but there's some good questions here. <laughs> uh, Shelby, yep, that Shelby is asking, I know, what are some of your favorite and least favorite things about being a stage manager? Oh gosh. Um, well, my favorite, I mean, my favorite part of re the rehearsal process is tech. I love putting all of the pieces together. I love the puzzleness of it, the, the detail of it, the art of it. It's the first time that everybody's all in the room together. Um, yeah. that, that I love, the, the collaboration of that. Um, my least favorite part? Um, I don't know if I should admit this. My least favorite part is giving actors notes. Uh -huh. I find that really challenging. Yeah. Not because of actors, right. although sometimes that's true. But you but, have to do that. I, I don't think people know that. I've had many people, they, they think that the director is there. The director leaves and you're the one who has to make sure that they're coloring within the lines and they're doing right. what they have to do. And right. the show grows you know, too. The show does. The show, shows always grow and change and actors discover new things and um, and that's perfectly fine. And if I if I have a disagreement with an actor about something they want to change, I can always talk, call the director or email the director and ask them for permission. Or I can have 
the artistic director, in this case, Brian, come and look at the moment and see what he thinks. Um, but uh, I find it really hard. I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, you crossed too soon and so you were out of your light. That's something different than, you know, that moment is taking a lot longer than it used to, you know, cause I'm not an actor and I've been doing this a long time. And so I've developed over time a way, I think of talking to actors about that kind of thing and, and hoping, hoping that they trust me with those kinds of things. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do. Good, 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 good. Um, this is a fun one. Uh, Nikki says, Tanya is the best. She keeps the festival running. Uh, <laughs> And not true. It takes a it takes a village. Uh, here's a question, and uh, the festival is unique in that we have those post show discussions with uh, in the seminar groves. So in the morning at nine o'clock, people will come up and they'll make comments about things. So Nana Cat asks, "Are suggestions and questions from the seminars ever discussed in your weekly production meetings?" And uh, I'm going to start with this because. Most of the things that we discuss in the Grove, the stage manager already knows about because we've read those performance reports at seven o'clock that morning before our seminar directors actually go out there. So we know what happened there. Um, so have there ever been things that patrons have said or you've got word from, have, the, does a Grove inform that conversation or otherwise? Not really. I mean, the production meetings stop once the show is open. Right. Um, so we don't have those anymore once the show is open. And the seminar group doesn't happen until after those have stopped. So they right. don't come to us that way. I sometimes get uh, information about something somebody said in the Grove. But my responsibility is to the director and the designers. So unless, um, so I'm always going to give notes or feedback about a show based on those folks. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that, that meshes with what people thought in the Grove and sometimes it doesn't. That is correct. Uh, if it's a big concern, like if somebody in the Grove says, well, we couldn't hear any of this scene, I may sort of pay closer attention the next time we do the show and listen to that scene and try to get feedback from somebody about it um, who's in the audience. But, um, but my, my responsibility is to the director and the designers. For, for those kinds of information. Uh, I'm so glad, thank you, Nana Kat, for that, that question. I think, I think it actually talks about the integrity of the art and what we're trying to do while we do that. And again, most of those comments that we're receiving, you can't hear an actor, uh, a choice like that. You already know, and you right, can't. Right, right. Uh, some tough, uh, I think tougher ones. What has been your favorite show and <laughs> your least favorite show to stage manager? A little political there, I'm not sure if you can answer that one. But I think um, you can talk about what's a favorite show or least favorite for various reasons. Right. I don't know that I have a least favorite. Um, I mean, the, 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 the answer is really my, my favorite show is whatever I happen to be working on because there's always things to discover. I'm often surprised by projects that I don't think I'm going to enjoy and then I do tremendously. Um, so, you know, I try not to judge it too much before I go in and whether I'm going to like it or not. But um, so it's often, you know, the act of doing it makes it enjoyable. Right. Um, but beyond that, some of my favorite shows I've ever stage managed. Um, I did a show back a long time ago in uh, Alabama called Fair and Tender Ladies. It was a world premiere written, uh, uh, based, uh, written by Eric Schmiedel based on the book by Lee Smith. It's a play with music, with bluegrass music. And it was the world premiere. And it was a real, it was just one of those really special experiences that was beautiful material, beautiful performances, beautiful direction, design, everything. I could not, could not ever call the end of that show without sobbing. Mm -hmm. And the very closing performance, everybody from the theater was in the booth watching me call the end of the show, completely blubbering like an idiot. Um, I, uh, some of my favorite shows here, I worked on 12 Angry Men, which was an incredible production. I still, to this day, look at performance, uh, production photos from that show and am blown away by the stage pictures created by David Ivers for that production. I think it was gorgeous. Yeah. Um, Henry V that we just watched was another one. It was a real honor to work. I ended up 
I didn't rehearse all three shows in the Engelstad that, that summer, but I ended up calling all three shows all summer wow. um, for, the, for the first season of the Engelstad. And that was a real honor to be there that night of Henry V when the Engelstad opened mm-hmm. for a big momentous occasion like that for the festival, for the organization. That was really important to me. And Brian's direction of that show is, and the performances, it's just gorgeous, um, everything. Um, and the same thing with an Iliad. I, la- a couple of years ago, I just thought it was beautiful. And one of those things that just sticks with you, both for the material as well as the, the production. But yeah, I can't really say I have, I mean, I have moments where I'm like, I don't want to do this show ever again. <laughs> um, you know, on the 80 something performance. I, I, I don't know. I've only ever worked in regional theater. One of our other stage managers who works here a lot, Terry Alexander, he's worked on Broadway. He worked on Mary Poppins on Broadway for six years. And I haven't actually ever had this conversation with him, but it's curious to me, you know, the longest run I've ever done is maybe 80 something shows of a show here. You know, when you're doing the same show over and over again for years and years and years and years, how do you keep that fresh for yourself? And how do you um, not just want to um, claw your eyes out for having to watch it? eight times a week for six years. Um, but I think, you know, there's a lot of moving around in positions in those kinds of shows that they're, and they get to take vacations and they have covers and stuff in a way that we don't necessarily need to do as much. In an, in I, and I hope everybody's thinking, you know, it's one thing when an actor, you got to put an understudy on. I, notice what she's saying here. I mean, you've got that, uh, that stage manager having, you don't want that stage manager to get sick at all because she's got that whole show or he well, we, we have understudies of stage managers too we cover each other as much as we possibly can but it's it's a little harder um yeah. to to do so um what is the strangest thing you've had to record in a performance report and that question's from becky the strangest thing i've ever had to put in a performance report oh uh we kind of made it it wasn't really strange but um I mean, anytime you have to stop the show, which I've done three or four times probably in my career, I've been really lucky not to have to do it that much. That's a little strange. We had to stop Henry V and evacuate the theater because the fog set off the fire alarm. Um, I had to stop a uh, production of Christmas Carol in Alabama because the trap broke. Um, we had a big hole in the floor. So that's always odd. Um, but we were doing uh, Henry V again. Um, we were doing a fight sequence and a, um, the trap was open and, and Jade, my, my assistant, was uh, da- uh, down in the trap room with a bucket trying to catch the, some things that were being thrown into the trap. And a, a battle axe that was laying on the floor got kicked and knocked into the trap and almost hit her in the head. She was fine, fortunately. But the note was, um, Jack Lafferty tried to kill Jade. She's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we tried to, to to make a little bit of a of a lighter moment out of it, but um, yeah. that was that's kind of the odd stuff is when the show something goes wrong. Uh, we're at two minutes left. Uh, again, we're going to go just a little bit long, and you're going to be okay with that. Um, it'll be all right. Okay. Uh, I want to get through these Thanks two. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> They're really great. They're really great. Okay. Uh, Marielle asks, can you tell us about one of your most challenging shows at USF? Hmm. Uh, one of the things I love about this, Renee did the same thing. I just love that we think to the moments <laughs> that that's okay. Well, I mean, they're challenging in different ways, right? Sometimes it's challenging because of the material and it's just hard to get through rehearsal because it's so emotional. Um, sometimes it's challenging because of the people involved and maybe people don't get along or sometimes it's challenging because it's a hard show technically. Um, so there's different kinds of challenging. Um, uh, Joseph, which I did last year, was challenging in the fact that it had so many light cues that came so quickly. I couldn't, I didn't know in tech how I was going to do it. And I couldn't, I couldn't, there's not a single standby in my book for Joseph except for scene shifts because there was no space, no time for them. So until I got in a groove after a couple of weeks of getting used to it and sort of not, and taking a deep breath, that one was really hard to call. But sometimes the for me, the ones that are more challenging in that way are the most fun. Yeah, yeah, cool. You know, when you get it right, it feels so good. <laughs> Two more comments. Uh, Marjorie asks, and I was <laughs> going to refer to you, Richard. Marjorie asks, does Richard ever get a chance to talk? 
And so, Richard, I, I, I wanted you here because the role you play as production manager and the role that she plays as festival stage manager are really, really close to one another. So can you tell me, Richard, about the relationship you share with stage management and uh, how you work with stage management? Sure. And I'll say that we're, we're also developing it a little bit. You know, um, I'm just starting uh, as a production manager now, I don't know, six, week six here. Um, and so Tani and I are sort of, we, we haven't been, we're very lucky right now that uh, the festival has now a full-time festival stage manager and a full-time production manager. So we're working closely together. That hasn't always been the case. Um, and so uh, we're sort of, you know, it's new territory, but a lot of it, we talk a lot about schedule. We communicate, communicate constantly. Calendar. Um, yeah, calendar. Our, you know, uh, especially in a repertory company, we sort of we live and die by that calendar, and everything. When when production is coming in, meaning when um, the carpenters are on stage and Electrics is starting uh, their pre-show work or, or whatever, and making sure that those work alongside of when the actors need to be on stage and the stage managers need to prep for rehearsal or for the performance. Uh, we have to we have to negotiate those times and you know make sure that we're serving the production we're serving the artists that are working uh, so it's constant back and forth with Tanya to make sure that we're we're considering all those things that have to happen and you know in in, in a repertory system we've got three shows in a space um, and those have to negotiate each other so there's that other level of complexity there uh, so we kind of keep each other honest in that way you know we we check and we're checking balance on each other um, make sure that you know, everybody's getting a little bit of what they need. Um, I like to say compromise is where everybody's a little bit dissatisfied. So if, if everybody's a little unhappy, we're, uh, we're doing our job, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how we, that's a big part of what we do uh, is really just talk about how we're going to get all the things in there and facilitate all that stuff. The, the calendar and the schedule here is so complicated. When we're in the middle of the season, when we're in rehearsals, um, I have a stage manager who does nothing but the schedule. So their job all day long, each individual show stage manager puts together their, their show schedule for their show for the day, for their rehearsal block. The, the scheduling stage manager takes all of the, all six or eight of those schedules, puts them in a big grid, and then figures out how to get costume fittings and hair and makeup appointments and voice and speech sessions and secondary rehearsals and all that other stuff that has to happen to make this work, meetings, um, around that main rehearsal schedule and it's a full day's work just to get the schedule done for the next day. So it's, cool. pretty, it's uh, pretty complicated. Uh, this is where the Tanya would say, okay, we're done, Michael. Uh, two more, this one's a quick one. I just wanna know from Dan, what version of the 2021 season calendar, which will be announced very shortly to the public, but what version of 2021 are you on right now? 12. This is the 12th version of that calendar. Yes. And we can talk about that next week when we get into, uh, when we have the whole production team here. So please join us for all of that. Uh, I love this last question, okay? Do you have any advice that you would give someone thinking about stage management as a career? This is from Chris. Chris Holtz, I'm guessing. I, I don't see what it is on Facebook, but he's been a really active listener here. What advice would you give to uh, someone who wants to be a stage manager? Um, there's no right way to become a stage manager. There's no one, like Renee said about acting, there's no one path. I was not a theater major as an undergrad. I was an English literature major. Um, I did a lot of community theater and as a kid, but none of it technical. Um, uh, and sometimes that frustrates me now because I don't feel like I don't know as much about lights and sound and all of that stuff, scenery as I wish I did. Um, but I think the thing, most of my job is about reading, writing, and managing people. So read a lot, plays and all kinds of other stuff. It makes you a better human. And being a good human can't be bad no matter what you decide to do. Um, helps you think critically, it helps you be empathetic, it helps you get outside of your own little bubble, your own world. And that's important, I think, as an artist in general. Um, Work on shows as much as you can, you know, in all kinds of capacities, whether it's acting or work running props or moving scenery or whatever. Um, 
and, and learn as much as you can. Um, you'll learn what not to do as well as what to do, what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Um, and stage manage when you can, you know, in school, if you have that opportunity, you know, get your feet wet and start doing it. Um, uh, I would say that I lost my train of thought. Yeah, I mean, I just, just, you know, take in as much as you possibly can in all aspects because it's gonna serve you very, very well. Uh, as an artist so wonderful well uh we are two minutes away from this show being over and uh we are so grateful tanya that we got to see some of that goddess some of that because you are a great human what did i tell you mike bar yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> questions that i was not supposed to talk about how great or wonderful or anything like that but any of you know who know tanya that's that's who she is and that's why usf uh, runs the way it does. So um, I just want to thank you uh, for being vulnerable and sharing all of that with us there. Just a little update. Uh, we look forward next week uh, on Thursday at 10 o'clock. We will be talking to dramaturgs, two amazing dramaturgs. We're going to talk about what dramaturgy is dramaturgy. And then on Friday at one o'clock, we're going to be talking to the whole production team and uh, it's going to be really, really, really fun. So thank you so much. We appreciate all your time, and uh, we look forward to seeing you here in Cedar City. Thank you, uh, Cedar City and Brian Head Tourism Bureau, and thank you all of you who are watching us as well. Bye-bye.